Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, for those who are in different time zones, uh, let me welcome you all to this fifth annual Michael Bell Lecture. Uh, today's uh, lecture will explore societal transformations in the Middle East, how to respond. Uh, my name is Teddy Sami. I'm the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University in Ottawa. Let me first acknowledge that the land on which the Carleton University campus is located and the Ottawa area are on the traditional and ceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. Bonjour tout le monde, bienvenue à cette cinquième conférence annuelle qui a été établie en l'honneur de Michael Bell, un éminent diplomate canadien et expert sur le Moyen-Orient. Michael Bell est né à Windsor, en Ontario, et il est un, dipl est, est un diplômé de l'Université de Windsor où il a obtenu son baccalauréat spécialisé uh, is some metries. Uh, Michael Bell uh, joined the Department of External Affairs in September 1967. In a career that spanned more than three decades, he served as ambassador to Jordan, director general for Central and Eastern Europe, ambassador to Egypt, and ambassador to Israel. Following his retirement in 2004, Michael Bell, along with Michael Molloy and John Bell, with the support of Dr. Tom Najem of the University of Windsor, established the Jerusalem All City Initiative to find a fair and sustainable plan for resolving the conflict of the Jerusalem's old city. He also taught Middle East affairs at both the University of Windsor and Carleton University. Shortly before he passed away at the age of 73 in 2017, he was awarded an honor honorary doctorate of law by his alma mater, the University of Windsor. Um, I was supposed to give a floor to Mike Molloy, uh, who served as coordinator of the Middle East peace process at the Department of Foreign Affairs in the early 2000s. Uh, Mike and, and Rula El Rifai have been instrumental in helping me organize uh, this lecture in the past few years. I don't know if Mike is here, but I'll try to bring him in at the end uh, because I, I, uh, we've been having some, some technical difficulties uh, this morning. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, let me also thank the International Development Research Center for its financial support. Uh, and I'd like to also acknowledge the support of the Bell family, represented by Michael's wife, Linda, who is in attendance today, and also a shout out to their daughter, Caroline, and granddaughter, Clara. So let me now introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Basma Kodmani. Uh, Dr. Kodmani is a senior research fellow with Institut Montaigne in Paris and with a Barcelona-based Institute for Integrated Transitions. She's the co-founder and former director of the Arab Reform Initiative, a regional think tank promoting Arab thinking and homegrown options for change. She's, she's also an associate professor of international relations at Paris University. Dr. Kodmani, uh, in the wake of a Syrian uprising, was part of a small group of Syrian independent figures who founded the Syrian National Council the first coalition of the Syrian opposition. She was also a founding member of the Syrian women's political movement in 2017 and is an active member within it. In 2018, she launched Global Syria in partnership with the Asfari Foundation, a new initiative to gather the Syrian diaspora with a view to mobilizing it as a strategic player in rebuilding Syria. Dr. Kodmani has done a lot of other things that, you know, that. Uh, you know, would take me too long to go through. Let, let me just say that she's had a very distinguished career and, and we are delighted that she's joining us this morning. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science from Sciences Po in Paris. She has offered and edited books, reports, and articles on conflicts, political and security reforms, and religious authorities in the Middle East. She's also a member of the advisory boards of several international and Arab institutions and holds the distinction of Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur of France. So let me now turn it over to Dr. Kodmani, who will speak uh, for about half an hour or so, or maybe a little bit longer. And then afterwards, this uh, session will, will have a Q&A. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A uh, uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we should have more than enough time uh, to have a, a, an interesting question and answer period. I should also note that today's conference is being recorded and we want to make sure that this is available for people who couldn't make it today. 
Uh, so once again, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box uh, so that I can then moderate the session afterwards. So Dr. Kodmani, over to you now, and uh, we look forward to, to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. This is a real honor to, uh, first of all, be a speaker for this particular very special uh, lecture, the Michael Bell Lecture, uh, and a homage to uh, real diplomacy. Uh, and I want to also thank the school as well as IDRC for this invitation. I am, it is really an opportunity to have uh, with a Canadian audience an exchange over uh, what it is that uh, can be of uh, value in terms of responding to the major changes and transformations that have occurred in the Middle East region. I uh, don't need to remind you how much the last decade has been turbulent for the Middle East, but I think these early uh, 20s are also quite turbulent for uh, Western societies in the North. And uh, that is perhaps the new factor, but on both sides, uh, we are in uh, deep transformation or deep questioning. And that is what I would like to cover. And as much as possible, draw from uh, the very, very uh, rich news and, uh, and uh, um, the avalanche of information we get from this region uh, to see what is it that has been happening over a, what are the long trends really? What are the long-term trends? Uh, what is it that we can identify as uh, points of levers, points of pressure, where we can perhaps start to um, drive and encourage and foster uh, the positive change that really these societies are looking to uh, achieve. We've had a decade of anger uh, in the region. Uh, and I think the word, the, the word anger is the best that can uh, describe what happened. Uh, and, but clearly over the last decade, the instability, the violence, the humanitarian disasters have all, everything has resulted from society's protest movements, not from any war between countries, and uh, not from interventions from outside either as a start. And, and the interesting aspect I think is that uh, it was not economic stagnation that caused the anger. We might remember that in Tunisia and Egypt, uh, these two countries had high growth rates in the last few years before the uprisings. So the trigger uh, came from somewhere else. Uh, and I remember diplomats saying, we don't need to worry. Uh, these countries are actually moving in the right directions. Here's the growth rate. It has been 5% in Egypt. It's been seven, 9% in Tunisia. And uh, suddenly uh, something happened that no one was expecting. I claim, and I think we need to put this issue at the center of everything we discuss about this region. Corruption, which is better defined as predation, given the level of theft of public wealth by the ruling elites, is by far the most important driver of anger and protest. Yes, demands for freedom, yes, uh, but also what mobilizes those who are not particularly keen on getting involved in politics in any way, or even in activism of any sort. It is the corruption that brought millions into the streets of Arab countries. So uh, if, if we make uh, this issue uh, a central one in everything we discuss about this region, I think we will be closer 
uh, in terms of relevance to what societies uh, want to see. Um, now, of course, in the North, we have had also this, uh, the pandemic in particular has uh, caused an inward looking and withdrawal attitude by uh, Northern countries uh, who tried in the first year and a half, two years to secure themselves. And definitely COVID has been a factor that has led to less information about the region, less interest in the region and concern about uh, uh, the domestic uh, and national uh, well-being uh, of, uh, of Western and Northern countries. In the meantime, of course, we have had uh, a sudden American withdrawal from Afghanistan as a major geopolitical uh, shift and maybe the longer term shift is the pivot to the Pacific that the United States has taken uh, over the last decade maybe, but which is now uh, materializing into uh, the kind of bandwagoning, I think it is called in, uh, uh, in, in diplomatic circles. Uh, basically to uh, rally around the US position of identifying China as the enemy, rallying as many countries and uh, regions uh, to this uh, posture in the geopolitical, on the geopolitical scene. Uh, and from that, uh, I must say, that there is a, there is concern among some of the elites in uh, particularly in Europe, uh, because there is concern about uh, are we uh, being drawn into something that is really the priority for us? Is this our absolute interest? Uh, there are good reasons to say yes on a number of levels, but there are also good reasons to think more deeply about what it is that really matters in terms of security, stability of Western societies, I would say. Why the Middle East matters? I would say uh, because maybe of two factors and, and others might also be added to those, but I'll just mention those two. The first is the security issue. Uh, when these uh, uprisings turned into violent conflicts. Uh, they produced uh, very serious security threats that are of a global nature. These security threats have um, affected the societies themselves in the first place, of course, but they have also projected uh, those threats uh, over to the other side on, of, uh, of the planet. Uh, and I wouldn't say only in Europe, but, but way beyond Europe. Uh, and on this, uh, the security matter, which has been mainly the radical, violent, uh, extremist movements, discourse, and uh, armed groups have uh, represented a uh, major have had a major impact uh, on the psychological uh, conception of an approach of the Middle East by uh, northern governments. Uh, it has uh, social consequences, it has cultural consequences, and it has, of course, security uh, consequences. The first of which I must say with regret has been that uh, you draw one conclusion. Ah, after all, uh, we do need these um, undemocratic authoritarian governments because of their effective security apparatus. And uh, we need those apparata, we need the security services, we need their military capabilities or particularly their security and intelligence capabilities because, uh, because to, to contain this security uh, issue. Uh, 
And so uh, it has been uh, indeed a, um, a, 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 uh, a cycle in which the encouragement uh, and the uh, excitement and the inspiring uh, uh, attitude that uh, um, uh, social protests and popular uprising gave brought back the, through the security concerns and threats, the value of working with uh, the security apparatus of authoritarian governments. So uh, I think this is a very alarming uh, aspect of, of, the, of the developments over the last decade. And the second, of course, is the issue of migration. Western societies, have over the decade, the last maybe three, four, five decades, I would say for Europe, it says it goes back to the post-war period. Maybe for other countries, it is a more recent process, certainly Canada. But Western societies have chosen to integrate immigrants and refugees from the Middle East uh, over the decades. And these have come to form diasporas which are connected to their societies of origin. And obviously technology has helped them connect and reconnect sometimes and connect on a more regular basis with their societies of origin. So the idea that the effects of what happens in this region can be contained is certainly an illusion. Western societies decided years ago to integrate these populations. But today we find in Europe in particular, debates suggesting that uh, maybe we can bring the clock backwards. Maybe we can renege on our basic values, such as the commitment to grant asylum to populations under threat, a questioning of the patterns of integration of people from different cultures. So these tensions are there. But uh, I think over the last 20 years, particularly Europe, which defines itself as having a specific identities uh, of different nations, Europe has been debating whether it wants to be multicultural or not, while multiculturalism has become a reality. And in the meantime, we have failed to identify what this new reality offers in terms of assets, particularly how these diasporas which have emerged uh, and are far from being helpless communities, so, uh, how these diasporas uh, can become assets, are an asset and can be used as an asset. I'll leave it here for the impact on, on uh, what Northern countries. I would like to focus here on the fact that uh, the Middle East matters, but one lesson to draw is that societies matter, that they cannot be ignored. And they have proved that they can disrupt the existing order when they are angry. And so the stability of this region, which was defined in different terms, and the temptation to go back to this definition that you can work with security uh, institutions in order to keep these societies uh, quiet. Well, this has proven uh, a uh, false uh, assumption uh, because, again, uh, we are seeing that um, as a result of uh, repression uh, and authoritarianism, the flow of um, refugees, migrants, uh, and, the, and the line here is blurred in many cases, uh, is simply not stopping and is unlikely to stop. So um, I think the fact that, that uh, societies are expressing themselves uh, in such a way, they uh, cause this, they disrupt the public order in their countries. When they are violently suppressed, they are leaving these countries, their countries. So in fact, they have become players in the international scene. Uh, and, and that is probably something to reflect upon. Can we, uh, can we seize, can, can we look at them as um, um, players, as uh, 
a factor that uh, is not going to be contained, but rather is going to grow and maybe organize. Uh, and, and here uh, it is very difficult and early to say uh, there are the negative reactions in uh, democratic societies to this flow of migrants uh, and refugees, but there are also the positive attitudes uh, uh, in, in, in most of these societies. And thankfully, uh, these are also expressing themselves. I want to say that the uh, most uh, the most puzzling or the most worrying aspect of how these societies have expressed themselves is the fact that they have not been able, even after a decade, to organize into coherent structures inside their societies in order to become full players in reorganizing their societies. I want to recall a, a, um, a discussion I had with one of the uh, very active, uh, very effective and, and prominent activists in Egypt shortly after 2011. And this uh, uh, discussion stays with me over the years. Uh, I said, now you have brought down, you have brought down the, um, the uh, Mubarak government. Uh, what do you have in mind? What is your vision? How do you see Egypt now? And he paused and said, listen, we uh, have brought it down and we can bring down an existing order, but we are relying on you, me being the upper, the, the older generation. We are relying on you to see how to build a new order. Uh, the result was uh, that Egypt returned to the harshest authoritarian rule. Egypt has known over uh, many, many decades actually, uh, and even perhaps uh, back to the 50s. I think this is uh, one aspect in that I will want to come back to in a minute to say, uh, to try and identify what, in, what are interesting ways of working in the region. This is one major weakness that we need to reflect upon in order to try and find answers to them. Of course, digital means of control have given authoritarian rulers a new lease on life. And uh, we have seen in particular how uh, governments are desperate to go and, uh, and uh, cooperate, to get cooperation and support from countries that have this special software, the special uh, technology means that can help them keep their societies at bay and control them. China has been a wonderful partner for all of the authoritarian rulers of the region. Uh, they have all benefited from, China, from cooperation with China on this issue. Uh, in a more discreet way, uh, Israel has been able also to provide some uh, very attractive uh, um, means of controlling societies. But, but the societies themselves are also increasingly savvy in using digital means. So what we have is, is simply a new space where confrontation is continuing and is taking, is taking place every day uh, between governments and societies. That doesn't mean that they stay in the virtual world. They don't, uh, they, they do eventually come to the real world and uh, move into the streets of different countries. The second wave of uprisings that we saw in 2019 in particular in three countries, Algeria, Sudan, and Iraq have also shown that uh, the taking to the streets and, to, and, and organizing in the street uh, continues to be uh, a temptation and a, um, a very strong desire of societies. Therefore, uh, the confrontation uh, continues on both levels in the virtual cyber world, as well as 
uh, in the real uh, traditional ways of demonstrating, confronting the security uh, suppression by the security services and the violence that comes with it. I uh, would like now to, uh, to focus particularly on, on this aspect. 2019 started to show us uh, a, how uh, the protest movements could begin to organize in a more coherent way, but we are still not there. Clearly, we have seen in um, a, a, a shift also in uh, organizing along non-conventional uh, ways of structuring a movement. Uh, and that is away from, mainly away from political parties. Uh, in, in the three countries that I mentioned, Iraq, uh, Algeria, and Sudan, it is very interesting to see that the existing traditional political parties are, were not the main pillars of the coalitions that emerged <coughs> uh, in, and, and organized the movements, uh, the protest movements. They are more often now, in those three countries definitely, um, unions, professional unions, uh, workers' unions, labor unions, uh, women's groups are very powerful everywhere. Uh, the, the youth groups, of course, students' groups, um, associations of former academics, of uh, former employees of this or that sector, uh, these are, uh, of course, lawyers, judges, uh, doctors, uh, engineers, all of these, as I said, professional unions are uh, looking and uh, are, are trying out, are testing um, ways of coalescing and organizing in uh, non-hierarchical ways, uh, uh, but, but in horizontal uh, gatherings, in federating their forces, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, they are very fragile, of course, and uh, need uh, help, need to be encouraged, need to be um, empowered, uh, and that is where perhaps uh, we have a, uh, a real uh, space or, or opportunity to start uh, thinking more deeply about how that can be supported. Because the fact is that over the, the last decade, uh, in no country have we yet, in none of these countries have we yet seen uh, it, uh, uh, the alternative in governance uh, emerge. And it's, uh, it is understandable, of course, of course, that is how the world uh, uh, functions and institutions in all countries functions, governments function. They need interlocutors who can deliver. They need, uh, um, they need to identify who they can talk to, who are their partners. And I think this is where the kind of new thinking uh, or bold thinking needs to uh, take place. Uh, and that is where I'd like now to, sp to spend uh, the rest of uh, my time in, in, in this presentation before we move to, your, uh, to, this, to the discussion together. Uh, the first I think is already uh, provided, but uh, it is in the field of digital support, uh, which, is, uh, which is an area of how to secure as much as possible and uh, protect the spaces in which uh, civil society players uh, can continue to interact away from the control of their governments. Uh, these are means, uh, as I said, uh, China is using it as one of its main assets to develop uh, strong relations with the countries of the region, um, 
it is maybe very lucrative in terms of what it brings uh, commercially and what it brings in terms of, of business and trade. Uh, but uh, we are talking here about the return on investment in democratic values. Uh, and that is where the difference is for countries that believe in these values. Uh, the uh, making available to uh, civil society groups uh, these digital means, uh, protected and safe, secure uh, digital means, is, as, as I said, an area where confrontation is taking place. So it is a very, very strategic tool uh, on which uh, there is already a lot of, uh, of very creative uh, ways of supporting, but definitely an area to develop even more. The, the, I want to mention uh, an area which I think uh, can also be uh, upgraded and turned into a more strategic or taken to a more strategic level. That is to, for uh, democratic governments to meet with civil society actors as and consider them and elevate them to the rank of uh, legitimate interlocutors and potential partners in planning the different forms of assistance that societies uh, might need. And when I say uh, elevate them, uh, I'm thinking uh, there's, there was one attempt, which I don't think was, was a very successful one uh, because it had many, many shortcomings. Uh, but I think it's an interesting one to mention. Uh, about two months ago, uh, the French president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, organized with um, the help of uh, African diaspora communities, uh, organized what was called in France and uh, presented as a summit with civil society. So the president of France was sitting there with a group of selected uh, young men and women from uh, African, different African societies. So, but, but the fact that they called it a summit, I think sent the right message because it sent the right message to African societies in particular. It did mean that women's groups, youth, unions of different professions, that these are uh, the legitimate players, uh, they are the legitimate players because they are more representative of their, um, of their societies than the undemocratic governments that try to control and uh, stifle any uh, expression of these uh, societies. So uh, I uh, play with the idea of why not hold uh, a, a G7 of the same seven uh, key governments of, uh, of the North, of, of the of Western governments and democratic governments and invite civil society groups instead of governments. That could be a, a way of a, sending a strong message to authoritarian rulers who I think would hesitate to prevent these groups from attending or would also think twice before they harm them and punish them uh, when they return. So uh, we very much, we all know that international connections do offer protection to these groups. Not all groups, not in every context, but uh, no, we shouldn't be discouraged by, um, you know, the the the, uh, the, the governments ignoring uh, the requests and advice and sometimes pressure coming from uh, democratic countries. The power to uh, the, uh, the capacity to pressure, the capacity to expose, intimidate, embarrass can be really intensified and, and will work, uh, not perfectly, but will certainly be a way of, of um, 
putting these governments in a difficult situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis their societies. Because this recognition of, by the recognition by democratic leaders and democratic governments can breed results at different levels. It can help uh, these groups, of course, gain legitimacy within their own context. It, but it also, and that's very important, it encourages uh, these groups to get their act together and organize into coherent uh, coalitions, platforms, uh, group, different forms of groupings. Uh, and, and I will take here the example of Sudan. Uh, Sudan, uh, uh, as you uh, well know, uh, until the uh, military coup that took place on the 25th of October uh, was, a, uh, was governed by this, this sovereignty council uh, of a mix of military and civil uh, representatives. And the partner in this, uh, in this um, uh, council uh, was on one, on one side, the uh, I will say the, the 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 military the ugly military uh, those who are responsible for certain for a, a number of crimes in the system those who still are in this authoritarian mood and culture but with a with a, a partner who is a, called the forces of freedom and change which was a remarkable homegrown organization. Uh, in, in, inside Sudan, which organized on their own, uh, obviously with the, the cumulative uh, effect of support uh, and empowerment uh, and maybe, uh, and, and training and capacity building and the interaction with Western and democratic governments. But uh, what was very important was that uh, the, this group survival at a moment when the, the whole order of transition was again uh, challenged by the military, uh, their very survival as a peaceful movement is now very much dependent on the attitude of outside players, whether enough pressure will be exerted on the military, whether the debt uh, uh, relief will be uh, questioned, whether sanctions will be imposed, whether those who have committed uh, um, violations of human rights and, and, and killed again and suppressed uh, peaceful demonstrations, will these people will be sanctioned and threatened with prosecution. The problem with these coalitions is that they are indeed very uh, dependent on recognition. And because they're not recognized by their own governments and they are suppressed by their own governments, the recognition needs to come from elsewhere. And when they are not recognized, when they are left isolated and trapped uh, in the confrontation with the dictatorship, that is when uh, they turn violent. In spite of the violence used by the military in Sudan, by the, um, the ruling elite in Algeria, uh, by um, the Iraqi uh, militias and intimidation and assassinations, the movement have remained peaceful. I think they have learned their lesson from those countries, first of all, from their own uh, experience when they turned violent, uh, they lost the whole purpose of their, uh, of their movements. Uh, but they also learned from Syria, from uh, Libya, and from Yemen. Uh, and that is why Iraq today is maintaining a, has maintained a peaceful movement and very difficult elections, etc. cetera. But, but I think this is a very important uh, aspect. The, the other purpose of uh, recognizing these players is that Western governments, whether in countries in conflict or not, here I can take the examples of Lebanon on one hand as a non, not in a conflict and hopefully will not uh, morph into conflict, and Syria, which is in an uh, in a very 
violent uh, uh, situation, violent conflict. In both these contexts, uh, the, the need to find, uh, to identify non-governmental channels to send aid through uncompromised channels is absolutely vital. It is useless to support the Lebanese government because of the level of corruption. Likewise, it is a, a only helping the Syrian uh, Assad government to remain in power, to regain control over society, if all of the aid, uh, assistance, whether we call it humanitarian or we call it early recovery or we call it even reconstruction, the problem is not how we call it and what kind of, of, uh, of uh, support we're providing. It is about which are, what channels are used. If we do not find those uncompromised channels to work in these countries, uh, there is no way uh, to empower these groups. Uh, there are different ways, and I think one would need to spend time thinking about how to work with these groups without harming them, without exposing them to danger. Maybe there are ways of doing so, and I can't go much into detail here for lack of time, but we can come back to, to, that, uh, to this aspect. Um, Depoliticizing this aid, using charities uh, that are not only the opposition, very often governments create their own NGOs and pretend that these are NGOs. Well, uh, let us also say, if these are NGOs, do they have a bank account? Can we work with them? Uh, will they be allowed to channel aid? And, and, and I can testify that in a context as difficult as the Syrian context, there are some small charity uh, NGOs which are distributing aid and are recognized by the government. Um, how much can we push uh, these small channels, these tight, very narrow channels and uh, encourage them? Local level structures, councils, etc., are also uh, ways of, of reaching the population. And finally, diasporas. Diasporas are very creative um, because they're very motivated in finding ways of reaching inside the, the countries through informal means. So I think uh, the diasporas in most of these of, our, of Western countries should also be encouraged to organize, to organize, to structure themselves and become actual players. Uh, I was mentioning earlier this summit that uh, President Macron called in, uh, for uh, Africa. It was a show, I said, because uh, we found out uh, that the diaspora, some diaspora Africans were trying so hard to set up a diaspora fund to support uh, projects uh, in Africa. And, and they had been struggling for four years with paperwork and couldn't establish yet that fund. But, uh, that, that should uh, not happen, of course, but diasporas should be encouraged to organize. And I think many of them have organized, uh, whether it's the Indian diaspora or African diaspora in, uh, in the UK and, and uh, the United States, etc. We have a real potential uh, within these groups uh, of the diaspora. And I would uh, maybe end with uh, uh, one suggestion, and that is that, yes, it is difficult to, uh, to convince governments to allow uh, other channels than themselves. Uh, yes, it is difficult to gain the right to access, uh, uh, the right to work with the groups that are not the government groups. Uh, in some countries more than others. But, but even that aspect can become uh, the focus of diplomacy, the traditional kind of diplomacy that we used to know uh, up until the, maybe the early to the year to 2000. Uh, the use of traditional diplomatic means, contacts, efforts, 
the kind that Michael Bell uh, represents, I think, and symbolizes, uh, but this time using them to serve different purposes. And that is that uh, diplomacy with governments and negotiations with governments uh, should definitely make room more seriously for um, the uh, access to societies. When this is made a uh, part of a negotiation at a top level, not left to aid agencies and the few diplomats that can uh, talk about these issues with government uh, representatives. No, at the level of leaders, uh, of the top leaders of countries, when this is made a very serious issue, uh, I think we can start to see some openings and maybe some successes. Um, maybe I should leave it uh, at that so we have uh, time for our discussion. Uh, and thank you very much, David. I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Basma, for a very interesting talk. I think you've given us a lot of things to think about. I noted um, you know, your excellent overview of the changes that have happened, uh, changes that are still happening, and also the challenges, I think, that many of these countries uh, in the region face. Um, I think your focus on the role of civil society is noted, and I'm sure people will have reactions to this and also the need, I think, for outside players uh, to support these new groups that are emerging. Um, I guess I, I uh, before uh, going through some of the questions, I, I noted your emphasis on the diaspora and the role that it can play. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll use my advantage of being the chair of this session to ask you a question about whether diasporas always have a stabilizing role or whether they can also be destabilizers, uh, because there is an emerging literature about sometimes the negative role that they can play. Um, and then let me maybe ask you a couple of questions that people have put in the chat box, which are both related to corruption. Uh, which you mentioned at the beginning of your talk. So there is this issue of whether corruption is a root cause uh, or whether it's a core issue facing the region. So there are two questions that have been asked about corruption. One is whether you see this as a core issue or root cause or whether it's just a manifestation of bad governance and political immaturity. And then a related question to corruption uh, has been asked about whether uh, corruption, again, um, is a core issue or whether it, we should not be focusing on the potential of understanding deeply, and I'm reading from the, from the question, deeply entrenched inequality instead of corruption, right, as a core challenge in the region. So I think both questions are, are taking issue with corruption as a core issue versus being the manifestation of something else. So I don't know if you want to take uh, those three questions first, uh, and then we'll move to the next one. Well, I think we can, um, I think I, I, I consider corruption as the most destructive uh, factor uh, in social cohe of social cohesion, more than inequality. Uh, I would call it a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, it's because it combines uh, different, uh, the impact on societies uh, is complex and very powerful, very uh, damaging. It is not only about uh, where the money of uh, the country, the wealth of the country, the nation is uh, diverted, not, not reaching people and therefore not being invested, not creating jobs, not benefiting uh, the population. It is, a, it, it also, is, it is also what builds the resentment and the anger. Uh, a poor country uh, is maybe uh, 
uh, we'll find we will find that society accepts that these are the resources of the of the country, and therefore uh, there is no uh, way of of having a better life uh, unless there is real growth, development, and etc. But but when people uh, know that they are being uh, impoverished, in fact. Uh, and denied access, it's also the political uh, anger that goes with it. It is about uh, I, the, and, and, and when we think back of the word dignity, I think, uh, which was the slogan of every uh, demonstrator in any of the Arab countries, it is all about <coughs> these, those who are ruling us are, are, are considering us um, uh, fools, um, undeserving of any respect, um, uh, simply uh, the, the lack of respect for their humanity is, is what they see in the corruption. So um, my sense is that, for example, should we call it root cause or should we call it uh, core? Uh, I don't know whether uh, this is the way to formulate it. I would say, let us look at examples. Um, today, we have a, a ruling uh, group of people, civil and military uh, in Algeria, who cannot let go of government uh, of, and control because of the uh, total control or the 90% control they have on the wealth of the country, the trade uh, of the key um, uh, commodities, etc. It's the same in, in Egypt. If we were to see any change, how do we, uh, how do we uh, uh, challenge the power, the, the, the money uh, um, empire that the military have gained over the years? Uh, same of Sudan today. If you want to bring back the sovereignty council, the civil, the composition of this transition council, are these people going to negotiate just their control over the resources? Because that's what they have. And their fear is, yes, prosecution, because they know they've committed crimes, but it's about, uh, it's about the, the wealth they control. Uh, will they be allowed to do so? Will there be such a trade-off of them ceding power again or bringing back the civilians versus allowing them to control the resources while the country is indebted to a level that is unbearable? So uh, we, we were reaching these extremes uh, because of the corruption issue. Uh, it, and, and I think what we need is a very serious uh, diag diagnosis of the exact impact of corruption and the behavior of corrupt leaders uh, and, uh, and the results of that the, and the impact on society, etc. So I, I should leave it at that, but I, I really think it is a core, maybe the core issue that we need to uh, deconstruct and, and understand better. There's a very specific question about the role of outside players. So the question is about, in this case, the role of European leadership and whether they understand the consequences of legitimizing or supporting authoritarians and dictators in the Arab world. And what do you think stands in the way of European leaders to listen to the voices of a people? And here there's an example uh, which is being provided, such, such as in Egypt, uh, where people are calling for change and dignity? Well, uh, I think what we, what we have in Europe is, as I said, unfortunately, a very inward looking and very um, um, it, it's, it's a, it has been, uh, particularly since the, the conflict uh, became very violent and affected Europe uh, from Syria. Uh, it was uh, 
about uh, the idea that you could contain it. Uh, and so the, uh, until now, what we hear in Europe is uh, when, they, when Europe speaks of the Middle East and Africa, it's the threats that come from these regions, the threats. It's only in terms of threats that issues are, are presented. So uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, there are threats. Uh, but but it's uh, it's a totally defensive uh, attitude, which is uh, which is causing uh, which is actually poisoning the domestic debates about the presence of of uh, communities from North Africa, the Middle East, it's uh, the Muslim world, the Arab worlds. Uh, and, and this is, uh, as we know, is also causing the emergence of populist leaders. It's, uh, uh, it's causing, it. but even among the intellectuals, we're finding this. So there is a real uh, impact on uh, the, 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 the democratic uh, debates uh, in, in Europe. Uh, that is very alarming. And I think it is alarming because in fact, it is a result of, uh, in my opinion, a result of this uh, containment and defensive uh, attitude. Uh, today, when we when we saw the Afghanistan disastrous withdrawal, uh, the discussion in Europe was not about uh, what is going to become of Afghanistan and and how how much should we uh, be interested in the stability of this country? It was all about how many migrants are we going to have to deal with? Uh, how much are we going to allow into Europe? Uh, that was the only debate. Uh, and, and this is remarkable and, and very alarming. Uh, and so it is a message of um, rejection, basically, to communities who have their uh, um, uh, who have uh, their kings, relatives, friends, people from their uh, home countries as well, who are already integrated and living and have become citizens of the EU. So this continuity is broken somewhere uh, artificially and 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 in a in a sort of um, uh, uh, brutal way, abrupt way. Uh, and, and causing the alienation of the communities inside uh, European societies and the pressure uh, and the absence of reflection on what it is that these, these uh, regions can bring in terms of even power. If you can, if Europe can mobilize uh, Africa and the Middle East uh, countries, Europe will become a much more powerful player than just watch China expand its influence in Africa and in the Middle East and uh, whine about it. Uh, that is what we have at the moment. It is observing what is going on over out there. Oh, Turkey is investing in Africa. Oh, China has now taken over and is negotiating military bases, maritime bases and, and, and uh, huge trade agreements and so on. This is the attitude that we are seeing. And I think we have to, um, I do not know what will change that. I'm just hoping that those who see uh, longer term uh, see that this can only be a, lose, uh, a losing strategy. I don't know if this answers the question. I think, I think it does. And it, there's an interesting question that was posed in the chat box, which I just saw, and which is, I think, somewhat related to what you've discussed. And it's asked in a different way, but very much along the same lines, which is, how do you bridge the gap between the security needs of the West or outside players and the uncompromised interests of the masses against their own regimes? Um, there's a long sort of comment before that that precedes it, which I'm not going to read, but you know, it, it's really about this sort of divergence between what the West wants and what the people uh, want in the Middle East. I don't know if you want to respond to that one. Yes, I think, uh, um, I think we have a, a, 
it, there, there's no, there is no uh, easy answer to that. And that, in fact, there's no easy answer uh, to either the work with civil societies or with the work with governments. It is impossible to say work with civil societies, ignore governments. Obviously, you have to work and you do have to uh, hold uh, the governments of the region uh, responsible for uh, controlling uh, certain at players, not all. So yes, there must be cooperation on counterterrorism, extremist groups, uh, jihadis going from one country to another, cooperating, etc. The 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 uh, the money uh, 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 channels that they use and and all of that. Yes, uh, there is a legitimate uh, um, reason to work with governments on that. But it, it is also, uh, um, I think, very, uh, there's an attitude in when you cooperate with these governments uh, that unfortunately is not always respected. Um, European governments in particular, but not only, they uh, uh, go to, uh, to discuss security issues with the governments of the region as if uh, they are asking for a favor. Please hold the migrants back. Please control these extremists. Help us uh, work uh, you know, with your intelligence capacity, whether we can, fine. But uh, uh, there is also uh, a lot that Europe is, uh, taking, uh, uh, and, and not only Europe, I mean, it, this is also true of, 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 of Canada. Um, the consequences of the bad governance uh, are, uh, are, are being felt in the North, in Northern societies directly. Who is responsible for that? It is these governments. And, and, and the, the message is, Look, you have created a mess in your own countries. Uh, we are here to, <laughs> we need to sort this out together. Now, of course, you cannot tell a, an authoritarian government, we are negotiating your departure. Uh, you need to step down. Uh, and that was the best, maybe the mistake back in 2011. Excitement, some governments stepped down and therefore, oh, well then those others should step down. Well, they didn't step down. And now today they think they were right not to step down uh, because they survived. Uh, and so I think uh, um, the discussion as uh, in, a give, in a more give and take relationship, rather than rushing to them and asking, please uh, uh, you know, um, um, help us identify or uh, this or that dangerous extremist who is, uh, who may come to uh, Europe, uh, or again, as I said, with the, with the migrants, uh, uh, some really uh, unpleasant deals are being uh, struck with the authoritarian governments. Okay. There's a very specific question that was asked earlier, and it's about, it's, uh, you know, it, it, um, it's looking at specific countries, which I think is is interesting. So maybe we should, you know, I should ask you that one, which is, about Lebanon in particular, uh, and how do you get rid of sectarian political of a sectarian political system, which I assume would apply not just to Lebanon but to other contexts as well? And how what do you see the role of Syria in Lebanon? How do you see that? Let me deal with the other the second part of the question uh, <laughs> first and say that um, today the key uh, player or the most influential player is not Syria anymore in Lebanon. Of course, it can, uh, it still has a nuisance capacity that is non-negligible, but uh, the key player is more Iran as it is actually in Syria. And so it is more to watch who are Iran's allies, uh, Hezbollah in particular, uh, and 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 focus on, on that that kind of influence. Uh, how to get rid of a sectarian uh, system is a <laughs> is a very challenging issue. But again, I think 
we have, if we are to, um, to survey uh, Lebanese uh, youth, and particularly, I would say, uh, the youth at a level of uh, education, uh, from university to down to maybe school level at, uh, or high school, uh, one would find that there is much less sectarian feelings and a, a real uh, demand for uh, relieving and liberating uh, society from this sectarian system and moving to a citizen-based uh, political system. Now, uh, can they be powerful enough? Again, I think Lebanon is exactly the kind of example, and perhaps it is easier to do in Lebanon than it is elsewhere, but we have to think hard of concretely how you empower these groups uh, rather than say, ah, that the whole financial system is blocked. Ah, but we've put under sanctions some of these leaders. Uh, yes, there still is a lot of sectarian uh, behavior because the system is constructed in ways that you can only get you, the services you need, this protection you need, uh, the, uh, in fact, welfare uh, uh, systems are organized by the communities themselves by the heads of the communities themselves. And, and that is very difficult to dismantle, of course, but, uh, but there is so much demand for it. This is not just an elite driven uh, uh, movement. Can we think of uh, alternative financial channels to reach these groups? The fact is that they're not organized. And Lebanon is exactly in this situation where there's a lot of energy inside the civil society and still not the capacity to coalesce into something that is meaningful and can become an interlocutor. I mentioned Sudan because it seems to be the most advanced model of organization. But as we are rejecting the government systems, we're rejecting the polit traditional political parties because they're ideological, because they never renewed themselves, because they don't represent uh, the younger generation and so on. Then we are left with having to create almost from scratch uh, the news, these new forces, but these forces do exist. Uh, uh, they still have not reached the level of, uh, they don't have the sense of, of urgency enough to feel that they are the key, uh, the key promising player for the future. And in, and in this case, uh, if maybe if they are treated from outside as such and given the means through special funds, through, through special uh, delivery means uh, of, of funds, uh, and not only funds, and also training maybe uh, on how you organize, how these, uh, uh, how you build a structure and so on. I think there's again a need, there was in the past uh, by donor agencies support to political parties. That has, uh, is a, a bit outdated today, but, but it's not about political parties. It's about social forces. Uh, and if we frame it differently, maybe we can offer uh, more than just money. I guess it's only appropriate for me to ask you a question from a Canadian point of view, which is how do you see the role that Canada plays currently or could play in the Middle East? Uh, um, there was a question about this earlier, which was framed differently. Um, so can you give us a sense of what your, your take is on, on the role that a country such as Canada can play or should be doing differently perhaps? I, uh, first of all, I think there is a, uh, if I look back over the decades during which I worked uh, as a scholar or as a donor or in different capacities, uh, I think I have always witnessed a, a very positive attitude vis-a-vis -vis Canada. There's a very positive image of Canada across the region. That is a major uh, asset. Uh, it is not seen, uh, you know, neither colonial nor imperialist, 
nor having a, a any hidden agenda, uh, nor having any any and and uh, and I will mention maybe one initiative which I remember triggered uh, a lot of, of interest uh, and was a, a major game changer. Uh, in this international system, which was the creation of this Sovereignty and Intervention Commission back in the uh, early 2000. Uh, it was more of a civil, it was more focused on non-governmental players, and it was how you think about uh, the protection of, uh, of societies uh, when you have the issue of, of sovereignty. And of course, it turned into responsibility to protect. Now, this very concept uh, is now in crisis, but nevertheless, it stays with us. It's there. It is considered as a, a moral duty for uh, outside, uh, um, outside players who have the capacity to, come, to protect, to provide protection. Uh, and that has been integrated by societies, whether it has been reneged upon by, uh, to a large extent because of resistance from some countries. Um, so I think this is a major asset to, to, uh, to, uh, build, up, to build on. And, and as I, uh, I think the, the points I, I suggested in terms of what can be done uh, are areas where uh, I, I would see uh, Canada very active. Uh, one of them is, uh, I, and again, I recall a meeting of uh, foreign ministers uh, together with representatives of civil society of only women uh, foreign ministers uh, by the Minister of uh, Global Affairs. Uh, it, it, sent, it sent a very strong message to women across the world. Really, I think, uh, is it a one-off? Uh, was there enough follow-up to it? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe there wasn't enough, uh, you know, you, you put all of your energy into organizing an event because you wanted to be ha have impact to be impactful, but but then uh, maybe we need to have uh, a longer term thinking about uh, how you built on on the the impact that this has had. Again, it's the, it's a bit com comparable to what Macron tried to do in in France and did it in a sort of clumsy way and wasn't considered a success. But I think the message was right, um, and so I think this is exactly what Canada can do. We don't need Macron to take the initiative for the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I think it's uh, it, it, Canada is in a perfect position to host something like this, to call for something like this. Multi countries of the North uh, bringing these groups and saying it's a major event. It's it's something we uh, are starting and will want to uh, see what implications it has and draw from it a line of a behavior vis-a-vis -vis governments. Uh, that is not uh, intervention. I think the message about peaceful uh, intervention, of course we know Russia is uh, gets hysterical about uh, support to NGOs and foreign funding and, and so does Egypt and other countries. But, but, but uh, that is exactly where the negotiation needs to happen with governments. I still believe that traditional diplomacy to serve these kind of purposes, it is possible. N not that it will, if even if it doesn't breed results right away, this is a the most legitimate and the most um, needed uh, dimension of negotiations with countries of the region, uh, especially the countries where we don't have major, uh, and be very blunt, arms deals, uh, big uh, trade, uh, oil trade. Canada doesn't need this kind of, uh, I mean, these, these considerations don't stand in the way in, in a major uh, way and doesn't uh, prevent uh, a coherent diplomacy uh, in that respect. It does for other countries, unfortunately, for many European countries, but maybe less for Canada. So. Uh, I, uh, I think is there's uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, small 
uh, and uh, a stream of small um, uh, initiatives that can be taken. But within the point here is it, it's, a, it's an attitude. Uh, it is a posture, but a posture that is taken seriously. You don't shove a civil society issues on the side and say, now let's talk about the serious impactful uh, business. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I believe, uh, is, is, is an area to, uh, uh, to think in a, in a bolder way about. Speaking of Europe, there was an interesting question earlier about Brexit and the possible role that it could have had on the European approach uh, to the Middle East. So do you think that the absence of a UK voice in Europe has changed uh, Europe's fo foreign policy approach? Ah, yes, certainly. Uh, but, but we are still uh, waking up from uh, the shock of Brexit uh, in Europe. Uh, the Europeans, the, the big countries of Europe, Germany, France, Italy, uh, maybe Spain as well, are more comfortable working with Britain than they are with the uh, countries of uh, Eastern Europe, which have a very different uh, perspective on uh, the role of Russia and how you relate to different regions of this world. Uh, so uh, I, my belief is that uh, in terms of foreign uh, initiatives, uh, the UK is doing very much what Germany, France, Italy, Spain are, are trying to do as uh, within the EU. Uh, and we are in a phase where the UK government is talking about global Britain. But uh, I think after a while, uh, both sides will realize that uh, uh, a more effective way of, of operating in terms of foreign policy, security capacity, military capacity in the Sahel to fight uh, uh, ISIS uh, in, in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, or in the Middle East, uh, we need the UK in, in, an, in a European effort. So my belief is after a while, we will see these kinds of discussions take place again, and maybe uh, a structuring of foreign policy initiatives that are not necessarily bringing along uh, all of the European countries, uh, all the members of the EU. So there's a question that has, that has been asked, which I often see in such discussions, and sometimes it's framed differently, uh, but here they, they are framing this in terms of a nation state system and, and whether you see the status quo, so I'm quoting from the question directly of a nation, system, nation state system as historically alien to societies of a region. I think sometimes that question is also posed in terms of Western democracy or of a Western system of democracy being alien uh, to countries in, in the region. And so what your, your take on this would be as a political scientist? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it's a legitimate question, but let's think about uh, how these societies have been structured, whether it's the Middle East or, uh, or Africa, uh, by the way. Uh, we have been organized into nation states. Um, and if I can take one example that is my personal experience, because we have these endless discussions about identity and we never come up with any answer because there is no answer. There is no answer to who, what is it to be a Syrian? What is it to be an Iraqi? Maybe Egyptians can say they have an identity of their own, yes. But that's about it because they are in a very old nation. Other countries of the region are recent nations. Uh, is this artificial? Yes. Should it be a question? No, I don't think so. I think what should happen is in fact, the, uh, uh, as I said, I'll take the example of Syria. There is a sense that we are Syrian. Why do we define ourselves as Syrians? Uh, well, we are um, Sunni, we are Alawi, we are Druze, Christian, uh, we are Kurdish, uh, Arab, uh, Assyrian, and all of these different identities suddenly look so um, uh, you know, difficult to, to frame that Syrians come back to the definition of the nation in which they are. 
Now, they have a natural relationship in the Northeast. They have a natural relationship with Iraq. They, they, we have tribal relations, which are perfectly uh, accepted in the South with Jordan and in the Northeast with, uh, with Iraq in particular. What does that mean? I think this means that uh, the, what societies are looking for is the free movement, the possibility to, to carry out, to, to move from one country to another across the borders for trade, for education, for social relations, for cultural exchange, that would be more than enough to say, I am a Syrian, he or she is an Iraqi, and uh, we are all comfortable with our identities because we have a mix of all of that. Uh, that's how we lived under the Ottoman Empire. Uh, maybe it was an easier way of, of living. We were not nation states, we were divided in a different way, Still, uh, I think uh, the actual order today, uh, our economies, our geostrategic outlook, uh, we have 100 years of existence as Syria, probably 100 years also for Iraq. Well, Iraqis are Iraqis. And when Iran comes in, they say we want Iraq, Iran out, even if they are Shia. So these are uh, behaviors that are very telling of the fact that yes, nation building has happened in this region, M more than one would think. Okay. Thank you very much, Basma. I think you've, you've taken all the time you could to answer uh, these questions and there are more, but we won't be able to get through all of them because it's almost 10.30. So I think I'm going to close it here, but I do want to thank you again for, for the time you've spent answering all of these questions. And I thank the attendees as well for, for all the questions that they've posted. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to thank the organizing committee, uh, Rula, Mike, and Emily, who've worked extremely hard to, to uh, make uh, this event happen. And I also want to thank the administrative staff uh, at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs for assisting with uh, the organization of today's event. Um, so I wish everyone a nice day.